Looking good, honey. Keep up the bad work. So look, with recent news about Target losing $9 billion in a week after having a section for the Pride Month and the clothes and transgender and wait a minute, what just happened? Why did they lose $9 billion in a week? Why did Bud Light just lose 28% of sales and it's not even slowing down and all of a sudden they're coming back saying, no, 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 we, we love our drinkers and we're not going to do this Dylan Mulvaney thing. And then ESG comes out and says, oh, you guys had a perfect score, Anheuser-Busch, but after the way you handled yourself with Dylan Mulvaney, we are lowering your score and they're so scared. What happened to CEOs? number one customer being the buyer you and i then their employees then the investors today these s p 500 companies why are they so scared of blackrock why are they so scared of their esg scores we're going to take a deep dive into that topic in this video All right, so if you get value from this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Let's get right into it. What is ESG? ESG is a score to measure how well a company addresses risks with respect to environmental, social, and governance. Hence, ESG. Issues in its day-to-day work and operations. These risks include matters like carbon emissions, employee safety, and board diversity. The system uses analysts and algorithms to calculate environmental, social, and governance ratings that are then combined into a score. So where did ESG come from? In 2006, the United nations enacted the principles for responsible investment pri pri is a set of six principles that outline how investors can integrate environmental social and governance esg factors into their investment decisions the pri has been signed by over ready 3,000 investors representing over 40 trillion dollars in asset under management. These are the six principles of the PRI. Number one, incorporate ESG issues into our investment analysis and decision-making process. Number two, seek to ensure that our investment activities are aligned with our commitments to responsible investment. Number three, disclose our investment policy and procedures in relation to responsible investment. Number four, encourage investment managers to incorporate ESG issues into their decision-making process. Number five, work with investee companies to promote responsible business practices. Investee, meaning companies that they invested in to investee companies. Number six, promote the PRI within the investment community and with other stakeholders. So wait, UN as in like United Nations, United Nations? Yes. What what the hell does United Nations has to do with the way Bud Light or Target or other businesses on S&P do business? Well, this is how they have had to chokehold on companies to get them to hit a score so they do what United Nation wants them to do, which is what a lot of people in America are worried, saying, wait a minute, why not just worry about America? Who the hell are those guys to tell us how we live our lives, how we run our companies? That's what happens when companies become global companies. Some of these companies want more control. Let me even go deeper into how much control the United Nations, UN, has over these companies. So, UN has powers to influence the flow of capital and set international laws. Companies need capital. You have a high score, you get capital. You have a low score, we're not giving you the capital you want. Number one, legislative powers. The UN can pass resolutions that impose sanctions on or invest in sustainable development projects. Control. Number two, judicial power. The International Court of Justice, ICJ, can impact the rights of investors and ability of countries to regulate the flow of capital. More control. Number three, financial powers. The UN has influence over the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which have the power to lend money to countries and to influence the flow of capital. Control. The UN has several ways to influence these institutions, including the UN General Assembly and the Security Council can pass resolutions that are binding on the World Bank and the IMF. The UN can appoint representatives to the boards of World Bank and the IMF. The UN can provide funding to the World Bank and the IMF. The UN can issue reports and studies that can make recommendations to the World Bank and the IMF. So the next question will be, is there somebody above the UN? Who is above the UN? Who controls the UN? Well, let's take a look. NGOs have the most significant influence on the UN's decision-making process. NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Through lobbying, advocacy, and partnerships, NGOs have massive influence over the UN's agenda. They also have played a significant role in mobilizing public opinion on UN-related issues. The NGO that encouraged the UN to enact the Principles for Responsible Investment, PRI, was the United Nations Environment Program Finance Initiative, or UNEPFI, is a part 
partnership between the UN Environment Program and the financial community. So having said that, some of the largest NGOs today include Amnesty International. Revenue was roughly $392 million last year. Doctors Without Borders, they had a $2 billion revenue. World Wildlife Fund, they have a revenue of $256, $257 million. Oxfam, $119 million. Save the Children, $950 million. And so now the next question would be, so who controls uh, uh, the UN NGOs? Now, who controls NGOs? Let's take a look. Top donors. So who are these top donors? Well, governments, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland are the top individual donors into the UNEPFI. So financial institutions such as AXA, BMP, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, ING, these financial institutions provide funding to UNEPFI through their membership fees and through their participation in various programs and initiatives. Foundations such as Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, these foundations provide funding through their grants and through their participation participations in various programs and initiatives. You ready for the next one? This one's kind of weird. Ready? Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has donated billions of dollars to various NGOs worldwide and partnered with NGOs like the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and many others. George Soros Open Society Foundation, HRC. According to Open Society Foundation, the organization has given a total of $100 million to HRC over the past 10 years, which has been used to support a wide range of organizations work, including legal challenges to anti-LGBTQ laws, public education campaigns about LGBTQ issues and lobbying efforts for LGBTQ rights legislation. By the way, if you're wondering how big Open Society Foundation is, which Soros gave $100 million to, he's given to them since 1984, $32 billion of his own money. Soros, his own money, $32 billion has been given to Open Society. It's a massive ran by George Soros. So it's crazy, right? You think about all these big organizations. Why, why do they care so much what these companies do? Why do why do they fear with this ESG score? Some? Why are they doing so many things that makes no sense? Why would Bud Light target a transgender audience? They don't drink your beer. You have military. Why would you make such dumb decisions? Because they're worried about pleasing the score. Here's a story from Bloomberg regarding BlackRock and Larry Fink. Watch this. In 2020, Larry Fink declared that a fundamental reshaping of global capitalism was underway and that his firm would help lead it by making it easier to invest in companies with favorable environmental and social practices. Our flows continue to grow and dominate, Fink said, regarding ESG funds. On the same conference call with analysts, he added, BlackRock is a leader in this, this being ESG. And we are seeing the flows and I continue to see this big shift in investor portfolios. What Fink did not say is that BlackRock drove a significant part of that shift by inserting its primary ESG fund into popular and influential model portfolios offered to investment advisors who use them with clients across North America. The huge flows from such models mean many investors got into an ESG vehicle without necessarily choosing one as a specific investment strategy or even knowing that their money has gone into one. In short, an apparent BlackRock-led rush of investors into ESG in the past two years has been something of self-fulfilling prophecy, at least when it comes to the biggest such fund on the planet, a BlackRock exchange-traded fund that trades under the ticker ESGU according to data from BlackRock and Morningstar. So do you support ESG? You, do, do you're watching this, do you support ESG? Do you have mutual funds? Do you have stocks? Have you invested into some of these funds? You may not know, but a portion of your money is supporting ESG and you don't even know it. That's what this is kind of talking about. By the way, let me give you some numbers on how powerful it is and why company CEOs, S&P 500 CEOs, shiver when it comes down to these types of things. Watch this. Number one, Net Zero Asset Managers initiative launched in December 2020 with an initial group of 30 signatories. By the end of 2022, it had 291 representing over $66 trillion of assets under management. It's a lot of money, $66 trillion. According to Larry Fink's 2023 CEO letter, today's global financial assets total is 400 trillion. This is 66 trillion. That's a lot of influence. According to Boston Consulting Group, asset managers control roughly 60% of global investable assets. This is why companies are afraid of going against ESG asset managers control investment flows. There is no other way to say it, but why a CEO of a company that knows who 99% of his customers are wants to pander to this? Because behind closed doors, that guy is scared of not getting a good score here. How weird, right? Three companies I want you to know about. BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. These three companies, the amount of power they have with ESG is wild. Here's an article from Harvard Business Review. Look what it says here. One of either BlackRock, Vanguard, or State Street is the largest shareholder in 88% of S&P 500 companies. <laughs> Let me say this one more time in case I said it too fast. One of three, State Street, Vanguard, BlackRock, is the largest 
shareholder in 88% of S&P 500 companies. Did you catch that? That's a lot of control and influence. They are the three largest owners of the most Dow 30 companies, overall institutional investors, which may offer both active and passive funds, own 80% of all stocks in S&P 500 companies. The big three collectively held a median stake of 21.9% in S&P 500.